Welcome to the Better Than Cash Alliance webinar on digital payments in the Ebola response lessons for the COVID-19 crisis. I am Camilo Tellis, and I'm the head of the Digital Payments Innovation and Resource Hub at BTTA. Ebola proved to be one of the deadliest viruses of recent times, with Sierra Leone being among the countries that was hard, hardest hit. More than 14,000 people were infected and nearly 4,000 people died. I would like to take a second to thank our colleagues at the UN Development Program, UNDP, and the United Nations Capital Development Fund, UNCDF, for all their hard work in helping bring a crisis to an end. They were facing a desperate situation amidst this large-scale loss of life and economic devastation. This case demonstrates the vast potential of digital payments to improve humanitarian response. Today, we will provide lessons from that experience, which we hope can be applicable to COVID-19. We have had over 400 registrations and have participants joining us from every region in the world. A warm welcome to all governments, companies, and international organizations, members of the Alliance. This webinar is being recorded, so you can always come back and listen to it. You can also ask questions via the chat box. My colleague, Farisa, will be collating all the questions received for the final discussion. I would like now to begin by introducing our speakers. First, a warm welcome to Mr. Stephen Geogia. Stephen is a native Sierra Leonean and a former Minister of Social Welfare, Gender, and Children's Affairs. During the Ebola crisis of 2014 and 2015, he served as a national coordinator of Ebola response. Second is Kazum Ndok Masali. Kazum is the Asia Pacific lead for the Better Than Cash Alliance and a former head of the Ebola Payments Program of the UN Mission for Ebola Emergency Response. Last but not least, Mr. Joa Basbangura. Joa has worked for KPMG, PwC, and he was also the Regional Director for AfriCell, the largest mobile operator in Sierra Leone. Joe was also the author of the Better Than Cash study, Saving Money, Saving Lives. A warm, warm welcome to everyone, and now on to our agenda. First, We'll start today with a brief explanation on the current challenges that countries are facing in regards to COVID-19 and digital payments. Second, Steve will share the key challenges during the Ebola response, highlighting the issues they face with the response workers. Then we'll hear from Kazom on the digital payments used to pay response workers who were critical to fight Ebola successfully. Fourth, Joe will give us insights into the key achievements and finally, will shed some light on lessons learned for COVID-19 before opening up to the floor for questions. Let's get started. While the COVID-19 pandemic is primarily a health crisis and a human tragedy, it has also far reaching economic ramifications. It is already disrupting millions of livelihoods with disproportionate impact on poor households and small and informal businesses. And the pace of this disruption is likely to accelerate in the weeks ahead. None of us is exempt. While working closely with many of you, the government members of the Better Than Cash Alliance, we have realized that there are three common challenges you're all facing in relation to digital payments. The first challenge is structuring emergency response payments which we see having two separate aspects. The first one being government to person payments to affected families. Some countries are actually trying to leverage digital payments to help households support the most vulnerable. According to the World Bank, we heard yesterday, 84 countries have reported changes to their social protection systems in response to the pandemic. Actually, 58 countries are now scaling up their social protection schemes. The scale of this is unprecedented. Argentina, Pakistan, and Colombia are launching new programs which cover a third of their populations. Peru is writing an extensive stimulus package worth around 12% of their GDP, and this includes extensive payments to the most vulnerable. In the Philippines, 70% of the households will receive emergency transfers. And in Bangladesh, another member, more than uh, 600 million from their budget are being provided for salaries to workers in export-oriented industries. However, it is important to note that not all countries have the capability to deliver these types of emergency social protection programs. The second part here, I think it's important to highlight the payments to health workers and people like contact tracers. Volunteer frontline workers are emerging as key actors to manage the pandemic. 
In many countries, they are informal, don't have bank accounts, and many lack IDs. They are key to managing the epidemic, but also pose many operational challenges. The second challenge that we see focuses on keeping the digital payments ecosystem functioning and safe. By this, we mean defining the rules or even changing or relaxing regulations in order to accommodate crisis setting. We have all seen the announcements rolled out during the last couple of days. Kenya Central Bank is working very closely with all the payment providers and mobile operators to reduce transaction fees. The government of India is disincentivizing cash out and promoting the use of digital channels. And third, the third challenge we see is how to communicate, how to keep communications open. We have to listen and keep learning, listening to our clients and have an appropriate way to address their grievances. The most important factor in preventing the spread of the virus is to empower people with the right information. Across the world, leaders in the public, private and development sectors are already taking decisive action. However, there are many countries that can actually teach us lessons in managing epidemics in a resource constrained environment. Our colleagues from Sierra Leone managed to do it and today they will show us how they came together to solve it. Now Steve is going to discuss the challenges of the case of Sierra Leone. Thank you, Camelo. Hello, everyone. The Ebola virus disease outbreak that ravaged large parts of West Africa over the course of 2015, 2014 to 2015 was by far the worst the world has ever seen. By the end of June 2014, 759 people had been infected and 467 people died from the disease. As of January 26, 2016, there were 28,637 cases and 11,315 deaths were reported worldwide, with the vast majority in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. Ebola proved to be the deadliest virus of the modern era before COVID-19. The Ebola virus disease uh, inflicted major economic losses, reducing economic growth that resulted in a contraction of about 21%. Payment to Ebola response workers was the bane of the fight against Ebola. It was initially a small part of the response, but soon it took more than 80% of my time. There were a number of challenges that we faced during the Ebola response. And I am sure many other governments will or are currently facing the same challenges in the fight against COVID-19. For example, how to get payments out fast, securely, and to the right people where it was most needed. Second, how to coordinate and manage a response to a health crisis that has transformed into a national crisis impacting social and economic activities of a country. Third, how to create the right policy for managing and paying Ebola response workers, including redressal mechanisms and payments that were devoid of fraud and could be traced to ensure fiduciary compliance to the government and donors who were funding the frontline workers. You may recall that Ebola response workers were Time Magazine's People of the Year in 2014 because they risked their lives to do the work that others will not dare to do, much like the frontline responders of COVID-19 today. Like COVID-19, Ebola hotspots needed critical workers in large numbers, and the numbers increased day in and day out, week by week, and almost every month. For example, from September of 2014, we moved from less than 3,000 Ebola response workers to about 30,000 Ebola response workers by March of 2015, 
across the country. To compensate, to compensate them, the presidents of the Mano River uh, 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 countries, particularly the three hardest hit countries, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, declare that all those workers will receive hazard pay in eight separate risk categories with different levels of payment. You would imagine what a challenge that was for us. The first challenge was to put together a list of Ebola response workers for payment. While the promise had been made among the presidents in late August of 2014, the first few payments were made in cash. The number of Ebola response workers increased as the virus spread and cash payment was no longer a sustainable solution for two main reasons. One, there were leakages. Two, because the many of the Ebola response workers were doing critical work and were not receiving their payments on time. For those who were tracking the fight against Ebola would have read headlines in the BBC or on the Guardian about Ebola response workers going on strike. This basically meant that we were losing the fight against Ebola. This is where the former president of Sierra Leone demonstrated significant leadership during the crisis. And this was one of the defining factors that helped us successfully defeat Ebola by executing a robust payment system. As many governments are facing today, the challenge started with the absence of a clean list of workers who will be paid. Therefore, developing a well-defined policy around this was critical. Second, the cooperation of the health ministry and their staff in the district was important to help move from cash payment to digital payments of ELWs. I can vividly recall the time when the president invited the chief medical officer, the permanent secretary, and the director of financial resources of the Ministry of Health and gave them an ultimatum of 24 hours to make available a list to us which we could use to implement digital payment. Third, in the absence of incremental approach to resolving grievances of Ebola response workers, when shifting from cash to digital payments, ERWs were spending more time trying to figure out how to get cash, standing in long queues, waiting and risking the spread of the virus rather than focusing on their jobs. We don't ever want to see that scenario again, where frontline respondents, including in COVID-19, will be worrying about their payments to secure their families' expenses and their future. These were the key challenges we face, and those we actively worked to resolve with presidential leadership and support from the UN Ebola emergency uh, team that was put together with the Better Than Cash Alliance that assisted us in this exercise. Designing a payment program that addressed all key challenges was critical and in this design, the digitization of the entire value chain of payments from list management to delivering payments was imperative. The approach we took that is applicable today in COVID-19 crisis will be an incremental approach. Do not wait for the payment list to be perfect. You must act immediately. The error of exclusion was worse than the era of inclusion. Engage with the private sector and innovators to leverage light technology like open source as we did in the Ebola response to ensure that list management technology and the process is decentralized, but using a common system to ensure an integration of real-time updates. Keep the digital payments ecosystem functioning and responsive to the crisis payment, particularly aspects of agent liquidity, 
lowering of KYC and work with not just one or a couple of providers, rather work with all digital payment providers where possible to promote a collaboration and an inclusive ecosystem. Thank you. Over to Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, and, and again, you know, five years later, I think we see this key lesson of really acting rapidly and get going as, uh, as we see the COVID-19 crisis develop. I would like now to welcome Kajom uh, so we can uh, learn more about the specific characteristics in the design of the digital payments offered for response workers. Thank you, Camilo, um, and greetings to everyone. As Steve mentioned, there was a moral imperative to pay the response workers. It was critical to pay them uh, on time, the right amount, and to the right person to fight this Ebola virus successfully. So when we as the Better Than Cash Alliance were activated as part of the overall UN offer, cash payments were slow, they were inaccurate, and they were open to graft and, th and theft. But it was important to get started and do what it takes to bring cash into the digital payments ecosystem and make it work. So there were three key principles that informed the payments program. The first, an active situation room through which payment challenges were proactively being solved by all those who needed to be involved. And that included the private sector officials at the district, uh, rural levels, central government, medical experts, Two, a clear policy directive from the government and its leadership to maximize collaboration and minimize competition in times of crisis. And this included assigning roles and responsibilities and managing it actively on a daily basis against the overall goal of getting the payments out. And thirdly, uh, an open communication channel, listening to and resolving grievances of workers of which there was no overall visibility. Basically, no one knew the total picture at a national level, how many, where were they, what were they doing, who hired them. And these were very important functions as we are seeing in today's crisis as well that Camilo mentioned, contact tracing, workers who are in the ICUs, ICUs community mobilizers, etc. Some of you have already asked us in the questions that you submitted about how the cash in and cash out and the safe functioning of the digital payments ecosystem was addressed during Ebola. You heard from Steve that we had over 30,000 Ebola response workers spread across Sierra Leone. And Sierra Leone was one of the only country, I think, among the Ebola epicenters where digitization of payments was a realistic option because of pre-existing conditions and also because of the flexibility that was demonstrated by the central bank and the private sector to do what it takes to make the payments work. Firstly, Sierra Leone, under the tremendous government leadership, had a focus on applying innovative approaches. We were able to move to a regulatory setup that solved real challenges around digitizing payments to response workers. Prior to this crisis, and this is now 2014, there were no legal frameworks for mobile, for mobile money. So regulatory relaxation to allow non-licensed mobile operators to deploy wallets and plug their pipes to the existing limited payments infrastructure, this expanded agent network from a mere 200 to over 5,000 plus in a matter of one week. Since response workers were spread across the country, including in rural and remote areas, liquidity had to be actively managed so that they had access to cash out when they needed and where they needed it. The second condition in Sierra Leone was that all response workers had one common technology, a simple mobile phone. So in the battle against Ebola, mobile phones proved invaluable, not just for sending the public health information, but also as wallets to receive payments. And this was possible because there was 95% network coverage and over 90% of the response workers owned or used a mobile phone. Thirdly, Sierra Leone also had a very proactive private sector and innovators that were geared towards competition, cooperation and win-wins. You already heard this from Steve as well. And this, these were the group of digital payment providers and innovators who approached Steve and the government at large and together in the situation room came up with options and were very much part of scenario planning. The urgency of the crisis generated very quick decisions in addressing risk and options. 
we know that moving away from cash affects response workers differently. For a woman response worker, for ex and they were 53% of the total Ebola response workers' workforce, her digital literacy is different or her connection to a micro merchant who are often informal and had been rapidly activated mean, meant that the merchant may need to be trained on appropriate behavior when servicing women. So therefore, working with all providers to expand the ecosystem, set new rules of the game to address Ebola specific conditions and put it to maximum use to support digital payments for response workers, that was important and possible in Sierra Leone. And having everyone at the table ready to serve these frontline heroes or heroines allowed us to design setups where everyone, everyone irrespective of their financial literacy, their level of education, would have access in a very responsible way. So while the work of keeping the pipes through which digital payments could be made was underway, we also realized the critical need for a common policy around targeting and traceability in a very mobile group. You already heard from Steve about the significant leadership that the then president of Sierra Leone demonstrated. We knew that if digital payments were to succeed in achieving its three goals, which were to pay on time, pay the right amount, and pay the right worker, it was imperative to help coordinate within government, with funders and other stakeholders to help articulate a national policy, a defining policy document that were used to achieve three key results. One, getting all the response workers, no matter who activated them, for example, by private health clinics or by UN agencies leading contact tracing or by the Ebola response centers. So they could all be under a common policy framework and they all know what they should be getting paid and when and how frequently. Second, building in a sunset clause in the policy to help government manage expectations around phasing out payments as Ebola cases dropped to proactively instill fiscal discipline from the get-go in response planning. And thirdly, integration of response workers database with the digital payments providers so that deduplication could happen real time and frauds could be reduced. So when working with government in positioning digital payments as a key component of the policy, it was really important to ensure that from the get-go, the, the aspects of responsible digital payments were up front and center in this policy document, and particularly on two key aspects. The first one, managing risk and providing redress mechanisms. Basically, speed can be done responsibly through proactive approach to grievance resolution. Second, designing products and services that meet specific needs. As I already mentioned, many of the health workers were women, and their access and their relationship with micro merchants are different than men. Secondly, the risk of transmission of the Ebola virus meant that physical contact, such as fingerprint scanning, et cetera, were problematic, but using facial recognition software was effective. The Sierra Leone experience, it demonstrated how defining these rules of the game from the start of the process, the policy basically, in short, success of the response was responsible. So as I talked about, a critical component of responsible digital payments was designing a proactive grievance redressal mechanism where the level of service and the quality needed to be not just excellent, but also empathetic. These were frontline workers, they were putting in long hours and they were working in dangerous conditions. So in solving more than 6,000 payment related issues on a monthly basis with digital payments, the grievance redressal was the only channel through which response workers felt that they were heard, that they were being helped. So when we put this together, the government decided, and this is, you know, Steve was very much part of these discussions and, and leading this under the guidance of the president and in consultation with the private sector, the, the redress mechanism should be coordinated by the Ebola Response Center and participation and accountability of all actors in the value chain was articulated. So to successfully set it up, we took three key steps. One, volunteers who were tech savvy, customer oriented, basically a lot of gig economy type folks who are mobile, they're equipped with local dialects to be the first line response for payment related issues. Two, work with all the actors in the payment value chain from identification to payment to develop clear processes 
and resolution mechanisms that worked on solving grievances within 24 hours. And third, communicating proactively about payment dates, locations, helplines, and positive messages in encouraging these response workers to remain at work while their payments get to them. And we know that you know, there were network management issues, there were instances of excessive agent fees. So such risk heavily impacted Ebola response workers and these workers included women as well and other vulnerable segments who were in remote areas or who were um, less literate. So therefore communicating proactively and creating an effective redressal mechanism that worked is crucial to boosting acceptance of digital payments during crisis in a sustained way. Today, we're all facing another health crisis, COVID-19, and many governments and partners who work closely to support this are grappling with challenges of managing beneficiary lists, where to start, who should get paid, who's deciding this. There were three key issues that we faced during Ebola that we had to solve and some of these issues I think will be very relevant to our members and to our government members in particular. First, lack of unique identity. Only 50% of the response workers had a verifiable ID and yet needed to set up a system that was quick and cheap and that would allow timely payments to response workers. Second, high levels of worker churn. In Sierra Leone, as you heard from Steve, response workers came from all parts of the country. They performed a range of different functions, resulting in fluid nature of payment lists. So without a robust policy and protocol to update lists, there were issues around duplication. And we addressed that by using Dedupe, a software-based deduplication library that uses machine learning. And this was back in 2015, and only possible because we engaged with the innovators present locally. Third, we also saw leakages, system gaming, and patronage in the beneficiary lists. So list management was further challenged by instances of fraudulent behavior. In the end, with the National Election Commission, we deployed their voter registration machines to create a payroll enrollment scheme. We couldn't use fingerprint biometrics, as I mentioned again. So we then resorted to OpenBR to enroll healthcare workers and incrementally replace legacy practices. This particular list management system and processes also helped the president of Sierra Leone view real time where instances of Ebola were coming down and accordingly order facing out of response workers that were geotagged, that were still getting paid. And this was particularly important as money is finite and governments need to use its resources effectively. So all these innovation, innovative solutions would not have been possible without the local innovators who found and deployed open source lean solutions for payroll management, biometrics, deduplication, logistics, and accounting. Thank you very much, Kazan, for uh, running us over some of these uh, issues and how actually uh, design um, came into, into play in order to be able to tackle the challenges. And it's also you know, very impressive to see actually what Sierra Leone did uh, five years ago already leveraging machine learning and, and really thinking creatively on how to solve some of the problems that they were facing. Um, I would like now to invite Joe, uh, who can actually tell us more about the achievements. Thank you very much, Camilo, and thank you, uh, um, Kizom and Steve. And, you know, so the result of everything that um, Kizom has explained led to, um, you know, two major achievements that were made. One was around um, saving money. Um, the result was that um, after the digitization, it delivered a cost savings that we estimated was uh, more than a million, 10 million United States dollars. And this came about through the elimination of double payments, reduction of fraud, removing the cost of the transportation of physical cash, and providing them any security for, the, for those cash. There was lots of logistical issues that were involved. There was per diem to be paid for the officers that were moving all over the place to pay these allowances, and then for uh, their the accommodation and various other costs that was involved. And additionally, even to the ERWs, the Ebola response workers, they had a lot of savings because it reduced the number of times they had to travel 
back and forth to check if the, the pay team had arrived and the pay team had gone. They're going to come, be, come back again on Tuesday. It eliminated all that. The money was in their phones. They could decide when and where they wanted to cash out. So there were savings also on their side. And in terms of the um, reduction of the, the fraud that was involved in there, and there was, there was a situation where there was a small number of workers who um, were double dipping. Um, they were claiming hazard payments under two different categories, for example. These were all caught when the hazard payment uh, program started with a common list management infrastructure um, that was provided by the payment system. Um, the second big benefit was around saving lives. Now, receiving payments in full and on time also substantially reduced strike actions. Um, strike was very common in those days, and they can severe, severely, these strikes can actually severely reduce crisis management um, and, and, the, and actually the response um, and of the workforce. Severely, and it can impede a country's capability to be able to contain pandemic and care for those affected. So what the digital payments did was to enable response workers to remain on the front lines help them save lives, improve the speed and accuracy of payments um, following the transition from cash to digital, to digital payments. It reduced the number of strikes from an average of eight per month to zero strikes a month. Now, with an average of 100 people taking part in each strike, this prevented the loss of around 800 workdays from Sierra Leone Ebola response workforce during the initial months of digitization. Digital payments thus enabled um, the response workers to remain on the front lines doing their work, combating the, the Ebola virus and its impact and saving lives in the process. Our case study calculated that the reduction and ultimate elimination of these this, this strikes may have helped save over 2,000 lives in the Sierra Leone Ebola response. And um, it, it's, it's um, very important to, to close with the fact that um, Digitizing the preliminary processes for G2P and, um, and also um, from G2P development agencies to, um, to people and um, you know, expedite the deployments and expand the benefits of digital payments in crisis situation. The clear conclusion of all stakeholders involved in the payments program during the Ebola crisis in Sierra Leone is that without digitization of the preliminary processes, like worker identification, registration, pay list management, the digitization payments alone by themselves cannot solve major challenges of leakages, double payments, ghost workers, and all sorts of inefficiencies that are due to dupl duplication of the processes and also even timely payments to the correct recipients. As you can see in the slide, the beneficiaries also benefited from digitization, for example, as we got started, um, they were getting paid in full. Uh, what used to happen, somebody sitting at the desk, I'm paying them cash, and they, they sometimes had to take commission. I'm paying you, this is what I get, and I can only pay you X. But they started getting full pay. Um, they, they started being able to access um, the agents that were around them, and rather than go several miles to get to where the pay team was, they, they no longer had to do any um, long distance travel and the cash in cash out network that was set out and um, through the mobile money payment um, agents that were around made it super easy for them to be able to, um, in their own comfort and convenience, being able to uh, decide when they want to go to cash out and in, in a closer and nearby locations um, rather than far away that used to be before we did um, the transition to digital payment. I would now like to pass this ball back on to Steve who played a very critical part, as you may have had um, from his um, um, challenges that he listed um, to continue with the lessons. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, partnerships are crucial to the effectiveness of digital payment during a crisis. And as an ongoing driver of financial inclusion after crisis have passed. Our experience highlights two partnerships that are fundamental to success. The first is the partnership between the government and the private sector. The second is the partnership between humanitarian, the humanitarian sector and the digital financial inclusion 
stakeholders. Commitment from and partnership with the private sector is vital. Existing private sector networks, infrastructure, and expertise can help deliver digital payment solutions faster and support sustained adoption of digital payment platforms that are needed when the crisis is over. Cooperation among government and the private sector and international organization is particularly crucial to building up an infrastructure prior to a crisis so that digital payments can be de deployed with minimal delay when the need arises. The humanitarian sector and the digital financial institution stakeholders should partner more systematically. I recommend that very strongly. By working together, there is a greater chance of implementing digital payments quickly and effectively and of developing processes that promote financial inclusion and drive economic opportunities after the crisis has passed, particularly for women and girls who make up the majority of the world's population of people excluded from, from formal economies and financial systems. But the humanitarian sector and the financial inclusion stakeholders need to incorporate each other's perspectives and experiences to drive a more robust policy making and for better outcomes. At this point, I would want to call on Camelo, uh, who will provide some wrap up to this session. Camelo, please. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, I would like to now um, see if I can actually just summarize the key lessons for our audience. And I think I have three that I, that I think are really important to highlight. The first one is get started. Take a lean approach and don't wait for things to be perfect. We know that everyone is suffering and here the error of exclusion is worse than the error of inclusion. Also, learn and keep learning. Listen to your clients and have an appropriate way to address their grievances. Second, solve problems together. A situation room that has everyone there enables people to solve problems together. Match lean technology and solutions to context and challenges. For example, design for low connectivity. Use open source software to assist in list management and targeting, as well as design processes in a decentralized way using common systems. One thing that it's also important here to highlight is that egos are not allowed in the situation room. As we have seen, it's really important that everyone comes together and is really focused on solving the problem. Third, I think what's really important also is to do what it takes to keep payments working everywhere. And by this, I mean urban rural areas and for uh, the government to be flexible and focus on issues that uh, really are gonna affect the frontier um, uh, population. For example, issues around agent liquidity, lowering KYC, and making sure that they're working with all payment providers where possible to promote collaboration and inclusion. We're coming now to uh, the end of our webinar for today, and we're gonna open now for uh, questions. Uh, Farisa, uh, can you please make sure so everyone knows how to ask a question? I know some of them have been coming in. Uh, yes, there should be a QA and a um, button. And you, we've seen some questions come in, but uh, Camilo, I've submitted some to you before during the... Great. Okay. So I, yeah, I see some coming in here and I think we can probably start. So the first one, um, I will ask Steve, uh, we have a great question here coming in from Kenya. Uh, how can rapidly deployed payments in crisis be paired with information to prevent misinformation, corruption, and exclusion? Thank you very much, um, Camelo. That's a really great question indeed. Um, information can certainly help reinforce and disseminate accurate and consistent information to the world public in many ways. Based on our experience, clearly the government information system 
served as a conduit to provide confidence to the public about the response and of course reassurance to the Ebola response workers. And of course, all the centralized structures that were involved in the response, whether it was the DACs, the DHMTs, the DACs, I mean the district Ebola response centers or the district head management teams, all had a kind of mechanism through which they can actually access information through the pay platform. On the aspect of um, uh, having a very organized um, and coordinated message, certainly if you have the information platform, it will help to relay to everyone to know how the payment is done, who is eligible, and under what circumstances. And second, it does eliminate corruption, particularly when it comes to our issues of leakages and fraud, since the payment itself can be tracked and traced in accordance with whatever guidelines is set by the government or by the donor or funding agency. And of course, certainly, it does eliminate, as I have already indicated, double dipping, even when you have a lower KYC. And on the issue of exclusion, again, I will say this. The error of exclusion is worse than the error of inclusion. You can always trace and expunge any wrongly included responder on the pay list, and the necessary action can be taken. But by excluding a legitimate worker, a, a legitimate responder from the list, will likely lead to chaos and a lot of distractions, which will not go well for the response itself in a crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, I'll move on to the next question, which is coming from the Philippines. What is the most optimal way to handle targeting and list creation? And, and once again, I'm, this is something that we're really hearing from a lot of our members over the past two weeks. Uh, this whole um, issue with actually being able to identify who are the people, especially their informal workers who may be um, receiving these payments. So A, creating a list and targeting. So Joe, can I ask you uh, to, to answer this question? Yes, Camilo. So the, I think he's on, um, and okay, Steve, it was Steve who highlighted the stuff. You could have two categories of, um, uh, you know, source for this, the list that you, of people that um, would be involved in the response. The first was the list from the Ministry of Health, because um, staff of the Ministry of Health had already been involved in the process, and they had, um, the, the government had taken a decision that in addition to their existing salaries, they were going to receive hazard pay for the increased risk that they are taking to do this. So that list is very, very important. Now, obviously, we received that list. As Steve mentioned, it came through a threat from the president because the Ministry of Health still wanted to continue to handle those payments instead of focusing on the response itself and, and treating and, and managing the health, the health um, crisis. So the, the president insisted, let's get this list. That's the starting point. There are partners who had already activated. So these partners were frontline, were the first responders. And they were there in those various locations in various districts in the country, wanted to get involved. And so they activated some volunteers and said, you'd be playing these roles. So like Kizom said, bringing all of them together in one room to say, can you send us all the lists that you have we got um, a form filled out for all of those people in those lists that would have the basic data, um, age, and, and, and various uh, bio, their bio data in that, that would be critical. If they have any form of identification, those are collected together. And then um, if you bring that list together, that's when you'd have your first draft list of staff that are already engaged. You already have the policy that um, Kizo mentioned that, and, and Steve that have been identified so you move from there. If you have them in, in, in an open source API wire, because what happened was the system had to be so dynamic that people were given responsibility at the various districts that when there are these fluid movements, somebody had been given a responsibility authorized to make those changes in the list at the various locations. Then with this raw list, we systematically went through a process where 
um, just key in all of those data that we had to get the first draft and then walked to identify physical identification. We got the, the kits from the, um, that was used for the previous election, took a photo of them, did the due duplication, and gradually with every payment we made, we were able to eliminate systematically. So like we said, you don't have to wait, but start with the list you have from the government, Ministry of Health, from all other partners, key these in, begin to work your way, identify them physically, get their biometric data, and then you could begin to clean, do the duplication. Um, this, is, this is how we went about it here in, in Sierra Leone. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, we have another question actually, which I think really also uh, reflects uh, some of the current challenges with COVID-19, which is uh, how do you prevent crowds from forming at cash out points on payment date? Um, I would like to perhaps ask uh, either Steven or Kazom who were there at the front line, um, if, if they're, perhaps they can shed some light onto this question. Steve, would you like to go? Uh, well, yeah, yes, I can share some experience. Maybe you can chime in after me. Um, definitely, if you use cash payment, you are, going to you are going to have a lot of people crowded, queues, um, just to get access to their pay. But with the use of digital payment, one of the things that you want to do is to have enough cash out points in the different locations to make sure that people are not being crowded in a particular location where everybody is going to have access to their cash. Yes, you can have your virtual money on your phone, but if you have many options where you can go and cash out your money, it makes the whole process very easy. And sometimes you can even avoid people leaving their jobs just to go out and um, get some cash because they know that if there are so many options, so many locations where they can cash out, they can definitely go out there and get access to their money. I don't know if you want to add something to that case. Sure, Steve, you mentioned a very important point and, and I would summarize it as saying there are three sort of ways in which, uh, you know, from a, from a government perspective, instructions and directives were given. One was the staggering of payments, as Steve mentioned. Not everyone had to be paid the same day, as long as they knew they were going to get paid. Um, second was that, you know, as Steve mentioned, many options to cash out, including, you know, mobilizing pop-up agents closer to where the Ebola response workers were, so that they were not traveling or collecting together at a specific point, say in a, in, a, in a rural district somewhere in Sierra Leone. And thirdly, which was not immediately available, and, and, and as you can appreciate, you know, the scenario was that you know, people were using digital payments for the first time in their lives, but, but incrementally, and maybe by the third or fourth month, sort of we started seeing instances of, of you know, um, uh, some of the response workers using the savings facilities that was available through the access to mobile wallet. So incrementally building use cases that promotes, you know, usage of, of the money digitally. And, and you know, in, in today's, you know, 2020, it's, it's very possible. And particularly in many of the countries where the ecosystem is far, far advanced uh, with, with, a, with a more deeper um, digital economy with variety of fintechs, also, you know, part of the response uh, of COVID-19, you know, incrementally building use cases on, on, on top of where these, you know, uh, uh, crisis payments are being made, whether to health workers, whether to sort of, you know, vulnerable populations that are economically or socially impacted by COVID. I think these were the sort of, I would say, the top three measures that were uh, important uh, uh, steps that the government of Sierra Leone and partners took that are relevant uh, for, from, from a COVID-19 perspective. Thank, thank you very much, Kaze. And I think you just touched uh, on, on a very important point, which is, um, you know, someone just asked us, uh, basically, you know, doing cash outs for response workers or um, as part of social protection programs are quick wins in a sense that um, if you already have the digital payments infrastructure and the social protection programs in place, it's just a question of ramping up and redesigning and, and targeting. However, there's a big challenge also that comes uh, from that, which is on the continuing to uh, have demand, right, for, for those payments once they have 
being sent to avoid cash out, right? And I think this touches upon this notion of the the use cases. And, and I'm wondering if maybe you could give a little bit more um, of an example of how this collaboration perhaps happened with fintechs to promote more usage or, you know, or have you perhaps you've, you've seen this in other markets? Sure, Camilo. So in, in Sierra Leone in 2014, there was, uh, I think, one fintech um, that was still not fully licensed by the central bank. And they, you know, could easily sort of support active um, uh, onboarding of Ebola response workers who, you know, did not have access uh, to any of the um, mobile wallets through the uh, two main providers, uh, the two main mobile operators. Uh, second, uh, uh, you know, uh, leverage some of their agile approach to creating those pop-up uh, cash out points that, as, as I'd mentioned, um, but in terms of use cases, the only use cases that was really relevant and useful that we started seeing usage of after Ebola was the savings in the wallet. Um, and then, you know, if you fast track 2020 and, and um, you know, Steve and Joe were, you know, in Sierra Leone will, will know this much better than I do. But, you know, there are insurance products that, you know, AfriCell or Orange Money is offering there. Um, there are, you know, other uses of uh, of the sort of digital um, uh, wallets uh, that have been made possible or that were first used at, at such a large scale um, and then, you know, thereafter regulated and, and, and a whole sort of uh, uh, policy environment that now supports it through, you know, an active sandbox activation, um, creating that uh, space to uh, develop more use cases with, with active participation of the central bank. Thank you very much, Kazem. I have another question here coming in from uh, Jean Gouess and um, probably for, for Steve or Joe. What exact steps did the government take to lower KYC? And um, what was the, basically the, the lower barrier for, for entry for new payment service providers in the context of the crisis? Joe, do you want to take that? Yes, let me, let me give this a shot. Now, um, the Bank of Sierra Leone, the central bank, uh, played a very key role in this process. They were there, the Ministry of Finance were there in the same room with the government and the president driving this to say, um, okay, so there were several things you could look at. Uh, so first of all, just get the names of the people who were there. What form of identification do they have? Do they have the last um, um, election? Did they vote in the last election? So do they have their voter ID, uh, voter ID card? You know, so in the first stage was just the form and whatever they could use to be able to identify themselves. You walked from that place onwards and the central bank, like I said, allowed that to happen. And then uh, during the process of validating, verifying, that is where um, you were able to get all other um, maybe requirements that were needed um, for the, um, you know, to complete the KYC process. But the first stage was just get everybody on board, get them to fill the form and we take, we take them through the process. Uh, but it was lowered to the lowest level. If they're already there, they're working. And because we're doing the verification physically, you would know they're there and they're individuals. Then you walk from there to be able to get um, the KYC requirement um, fulfilled. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, we have another question, which is also an operational question from William Durbin. How did facial recognition work? So there's, um, and, and this is where I would need them, you know, the technical, I know there's, there was a technical guy with the team. Um, we had a local a team here of um, young, um, you know, a young uh, software development company. But basically what happened was with the kits we got from the electoral um, commission office, which we, was used for the last elections to register, um, you know, people to vote was just walking around and all over the place because you already had this list that we're working from. The forms had been computerized and then, you know, who is this person? The person shows up, can we tie up the name, the face and take their photo? And they, so this, what they did the system was to just run them through. If you have common names, I think codes were identified at the end of the day. Numbers were given to these um, Ebola response workers. Now, so if the photos, um, you know, if maybe somebody registered twice. There are cases where somebody registered in one district 
uh, as one worker, but then he was moved to another and got registered again. So the photos, if you do the due duplication process, the photos where there are duplicate photos of the same names, they were set aside and you had a whole long list. This is where the situation room um, that Kizom talked about walked through the process of saying, okay, these were the ones that had been set aside because these photos look identical. They could now walk through them and say, yes, it's the same person, it's the same individual. You did the elimination. There were thousands at the end of the day, by the time we ended the program, there were thousands of those that were just double. And so you use the photos, the photos match and said, these three photos, they are the same person. And so then you did all of those, those eliminations. Steve, I, I mean, Joe, I just wanted to add that, you know, it, it was really machine learning in action. And, you know, I know that all of us learned quite a lot from these uh, techies that we worked together with and, and, and what great joy that, you know, they were present in, in, the, in, in Sierra Leone. Um, I, I recall that, you know, we had a long discussion about what was the acceptable level of confidence that the machine learning was communicating. Um, was 70% confidence level acceptable to say, okay, this is okay, this is not a duplicate. Anything lower than 70% was then a duplicate and, and therefore we needed to sort of listen to the system. So initially there was a lot of kind of, you know, working with the, with the system, sending a lot of data to it to, so that it can actually learn and then be better as, as the uh, payment processes continued. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kajem. Um, it's very interesting. I think very, very valid uh, in, in terms of the current crisis. I think we're almost out of time. So I want to ask one last question. Um, and, and I'll ask uh, Kajem this question. If you had one inspiring message for government officials trying to organize payments for health workers, what would it be? <laughs> um, thank you so much, Camilo. Um, Really, I think, you know, the key message that we want to leave with is that speed of payments can be done responsibly. So, you know, being, find out proactively whether there are particular communities in your countries that are finding it difficult to access the relief funds or the payments to these response workers and design a, a you know, a grievance redressal mechanism that assumes the worst and be responsive and active problem solvers with the private sector and, and the community assets, and most importantly, with the recipients. Um, this, I would, think, I would say, is, is the key message that, that I would at least like to leave for our member governments who are part of this webinar, as well as our other partners who are part of this webinar. Thank you very much, Kezam. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time, so um, I just want to thank our panelists and all our participants joining. Um, please, um, thank you for taking the time to help illuminate this, you know, this case for the rest of us who are trying to find ways to tackle COVID-19. Uh, keep safe, everyone, until next time. Uh, we have received uh, some great questions. Unfortunately, you know, we don't have time to answer all of them, but we will be collating them. And actually, I'll be talking to a couple of you um, who are experts in this to see if maybe we can create some sort of common resource of questions um, that are that can help us all deal from an operational perspective as we structure payments in our own countries. So we'll be we'll be putting that uh, forward in the next um, hopefully week or so. So thank you very much again, and hope to see you all soon.